Ladies and gentlemen, the plenary session starts now. Hello, everyone, colleagues. Uh, my name is Yukio Lipid from Harvard University, and it is my uh, distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this plenary session titled Asian Art Museums and Collections in the World at ICOM Kyoto 2019. Uh, we have, I think, a very meaningful session planned that I'm very excited about with world-class experts that uh, will discuss the panel theme, uh, which might be described as follows. With the growing number of ICOM members from Asian countries, uh, this occasion for the hosting of ICOM in an Asian country, only the third time uh, ever, provides the ideal chance to consider the significance of Asian art museums and collections, how they might better connect to local and foreign audiences, and how they might benefit by coordinating with international colleagues around the world in the future. Uh, this session also considers the various case studies in Asian art, examining recent moves to promote deeper understanding of Asian art in museums around the world. Now, before we begin, I'd like to uh, just say a few words about what we mean by Asia in this panel, because the word Asia, as you're well aware, uh, can be uh, defined in many ways, and historically, it has been done so. In the contemporary world, Asia is a toponym that tends to de designate different parts of the world. But I think it's uh, safe to say that for this panel, we are dealing primarily with East Asia. Uh, that is to say, primarily the uh, uh, region associated with East Asia, China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, but there are important reasons for doing this, because there are certain commonalities to these artistic traditions with a common basis rooted in Confucianism and Buddhism, a common substrate of materiality. The material profiles of artworks from these regions uh, tend to consist of fragile materials, silk and paper, uh, display practices that historically are similar, um, silk textiles and lacquerware, and so forth. Uh, but that said, I think we are more than happy to open up uh, during the discussion session to issues that would uh, pertain to uh, artistic traditions uh, elsewhere in Asia, South Asia, and so forth. Now, I'd also like to say that um, it's worth mentioning at the outset of this panel that uh, museums are currently flourishing in Asia. Uh, that uh, currently in Japan alone, there are over 6,000 museums in the National Association uh, for Museums, and that museum practice is flourishing in Japan, Korea, China, and elsewhere in the regions associated with East Asia. And I think the ICOM community at large has a lot to learn from uh, what is happening in the Asian uh, museum world. Um, we would like to also use this panel as an occasion to uh, use sets of issues associated with Asian museums and Asian art collections to inform broader issues of interest to the ICOM community, uh, issues that will be discussed in this uh, conference as a whole, including museums as cultural hubs, sustainability, disaster relief, and so forth. So this is a unique opportunity for us to really raise the visibility of issues associated with Asian art collections and Asian art museums around the world. And these are very large, ambitious themes, but I, fortunately, we have a panel of world-class experts that will address them. So what I will do is I will uh, uh, introduce our speakers now, all four of them, before we ask them to come to the podium. 
Our first speaker is Dr. Christoph Lind, who is director of the Rice Engelhorn Museum in Mannheim, Germany, who is very well positioned to talk about these issues because he has an MA in art history, Japanology and Sinology, and a PhD in art history, and has actually curated a number of different shows over his uh, professional career pertaining specifically to China. He's curated many other works, but specifically with regard to China, Chinese, uh, uh, a, a, uh, on Chinese painting and architecture, and so forth. So we are looking forward very much to hearing from him. Our next speaker is Professor Kawai Masatomo, the director of the Chiba City Museum, who is also a now retired but longtime professor at Keio University, uh, who is a distinguished scholar of medieval Japanese ink painting with a large list of publications to his name. He has served at the director as the director of the Chiba City Museum since 2012. Then we will hear from Dr. Min Jung Kim, who is curator of Asian art and design at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, also known as the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, or MASS. Uh, Dr. Kim uh, was born and educated in South Korea and attained her Master's of, of Arts in Curatorial and Museum Studies at the University of Sydney before moving to uh, the Powerhouse Museum where she has worked for the past 12 years. And she has a wide range of experiences uh, curating shows not just on Korean art, but Asian art in general there. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Anne Nishimura Morse, who is curator, uh, William and Helen Pounds, senior curator of Japanese art at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, where she has a long and distinguished record of both publications and exhibitions organized. I can only name a few here, including uh, Japanese photographers respond to the 311 disaster of 2011. That was curated in 2015. And the Takashi Murakami Lineage of Eccentrics show curated in 2017. She serves currently as the co-chair of the Arts Dialogue Committee of the US-Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange, or inter, uh, COLCON, which uh, you will hear more about during her presentation. So without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Christoph Lind to the podium. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure to just, uh, um, as a chair of the International Committee for the Fine Arts, to say some words about uh, um, the world of fine arts led together in the International Committee, ICFA. When ICFA was found in 1980, so we are just have almost 40 years old right now, when ICWA was found in 1980, it was not about to be focused on Western art. It was about um, the collections and the museum of all fine arts worldwide. For a couple of reasons, ICWA was just more concentrating on the Western arts for many, many years. And um, one aspect might have been that Asian art in Western collections did not always find its way into the art collections rather than the ethnological collections. That has changed in the recent years, and this was sufficient reason for ICFA just to open more and more up for uh, fine arts from all over the world to be integrated into the issues, into the working fields of our committee. Um, the last two days, have signed very, very clearly in a very pleasant way that um, the communication between the fine arts of the world are very fruitful and just give every single participant a huge, huge, huge impact and a, a, an idea of what we can do with the fine arts in storage, in the collections, in the display, and in the way how to put it into the museum, how to put it right in a change for a huge and in very diverse and international public. I'm very happy for the opportunity that we had a huge 
Japanese um, um, uh, uh, audience in these days, which, uh, which was um, very, very open, very interesting for this kind of um, mutual um, interchange communication between these cultures, between these fine arts. ICFA is about to uh, provide a platform to provide a roof for all these fine arts and this step right now here in Kyoto was well, the first firework that we have uh, that we started and we're not finished yet. We have another session together with ICDAT and GLASS this afternoon. But I would like to pronounce uh, the, um, the, um, that we are just leaning forward. We're going, going ahead in this issue and we want to integrate much more of that uh, on our next meeting next year, which is going to take place in Richmond, Virginia in the United States in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which is a house that houses Western art as well as Asian art, as well as art from South America, as art from Africa, and from uh, well, the African-American art as well. This is an ideal roof, ideal situation just to learn and to explore the interaction, the discussion between the fine arts worldwide, and this is going to be the ICFOCOR for the next at least two terms. I'm happy for, for this wonderful beginning here in Kyoto. I'm happy for the invitation here in order to explore this situation uh, right now, and uh, I think we are leading forward and just Eastern, uh, Eastern art, whatever that means, we just call that Eastern art because, or Asian art, uh, Professor Lippert has just mentioned well, um, the, the impact of this uh, categorization. Asian art covers all Asia. I invite every single collector, uh, uh, museum and collector from Asian fine arts to join us and to contribute and to, to recreate and to rebuild and enlarge our platform. Thank you very much. ご紹介いただきました。あの、千葉市美術館の河合です。え、ちょっと日本美術の特徴整えるという言葉が出てきます。え、これはちょっと汚い写真なので、え、複製のところをご覧に入れますけれども、12世紀、9世紀の世から10世紀に来た竹戸に物語に、え、妻を迎える貴族が妻のために部屋を整えるということ
机とかその机や棚の上にはさまざまな調度品文房具そういうものが並んでおりますこれは蒔絵です昨日のご発表でラカウェアのことを漆というふうに表現された発表者がいましたがこれは私ども日本工芸会伝統工芸の人たちはそういう日本語にしてくださるんだったらばぜひ「蒔絵」という言葉を使ってほしいと世界中に「蒔絵」という言葉を一つのタームに使っていただきたいと思ってます漆に関心のある方「蒔絵」というのが日本の特色です漆には蒔絵のほかに彫刻という技術がありますけれども日本は主として蒔絵です中国は彫刻ですさてこのようなお話をしていると時間がなくなりますので進めたいと思います出題という言い方が室町時代にますと字が変わりましてこういう字になるんですこの字になるんですここには規則性とかオフィシャルな意味合いが含まれていまして基人を迎えるフォーマルな空間のものを飾る時の一つの規則ですそのごめんなさい、えー、規則に関して、えー、書き残された記録がございましてこれが、えー、軍隊艦早朝期という中国のさまざまな文物を日本に将来されたものをどのように室内に飾るかということが書かれておりましてこれは座敷の次第というふうに、まあ、ちょっと変な下手な英語で<笑>あの書いてありますけども正しい翻訳になっているか分かりません、えー、下はお花ですね花角の場合文、えー、並という人が書いた記録ですけれどもさまざまな調度品のほかに、えー、掛け物ですね絵、えー、そういうものも並べる並べ方がしてあります、えー、先ほど出した建物はこの近くにあります自称、えー、寺というところの東宮堂と今読まれてますが,が足利将軍の義政が建てた時は阿弥陀さんをお祭りするお堂でしたでそこに将軍のための書院つまりスタディールームがあるわけですけどもそこにこのようにさまざまな文房具を並べるわけですえ先にですねお話しすべきだったんですがちょっと忘れまして、えー、お話ししますけれども実はですね日本の美術の一つの特色というものを申し上げるとするとヨーロッパや中国と比較した時ですね、えー、日本の美術には記念性とか永遠性とか完結性というものが乏しいあまりその,そのことを重視して芸術作品を作ろうとしていない。あるいはそういうものに対して鑑賞者は期待していないという特色があるということをまずお考えになっていただきたいと思いますしたがって日本の美術作品はごく簡単に言えば一つの独立した作品をそこに置く備えるそこにセットするということではなくてですね複数の作品を組み合わせいわばアンサンブルのような形でその美の完成や改めて鑑賞者が新しく美の創造をするというそこに日本美術の特色がございます。言い換えますと制作,制作者とは別に鑑賞者による美の創造というものが期待されそれを重視し日本美術の持つ一つの重要な生活性格として形成していったということを私は指摘しておきたいと思います茶の湯というものがございますが
茶の湯における美意識はまさにそのことを端的に伝え現在に伝えている一つのケースであります、えー、茶の湯においては道具の飾りという取り合わせということをしております、えー、これがネズビース館というところにある茶室なんですけどもこういうもんですね、えー茶の湯をするためのさまざまな道具があります、えー、掛け軸がありますそこに、えー、花がありますこれは室町時代の座敷飾りの復元してみ見たケースですけどこの伝統が茶の湯に伝えられているわけです、えー、茶の湯のことがわかるのが16世紀の後半にえー、大阪の堺の豪商の天王寺屋という家の人がですね、えー、残した記録がございます、えー、こんなノートがあるんです、えー、大体海外に対するディスクリ,リ,ディスクリプション記述があるんですがそのあとにですねこういう表具と申しますけれどもマウンティングの部分に対する記述がたくさんございます、えー、あれこれじゃないのかえ、えー、これはパワーポイントとえー、っとあこれでこれでやればいいのかなあそうだごめんなさい<笑>こういうことですねここにですね表紙と書いてあるのが表具のことですそして表具のこういうところにこういうこれは一文字とか、えー、これ中回しとか言うんですけどこういうその切れの模様まで非常に丁寧に書かれてるんですねここに書,い書かれていますえー、これなどもそ,そうですこれはあのネズビス館にあるあ、えー、南宋の木家ムーチーのーその、えー作品でここに記述がございますけれども、えー、茶の湯の別の玉館という模型と同時に活躍した人の作品の有名な波の絵がありますがそこにはですね、えー、ここに標語のことが書かれているほかにですね、えー、軸がですね、えー、ここ。軸はバチ,バチ型の象下だというふうに書いてあるんですここ軸ですねそういう軸までですねきちっと記述してこれを一つの美意識として完成させたということです、えー、さらにですねこれはあんまり、えー、日本以外にはないと思いますけれどもこのようにですねこれは雪舟の絵ですけれども雪舟の絵に対してこれだけいろいろな付属品が入ってましてここにこの作品を鑑賞した人の美学が伝えられているわけですこれを含めてですね日本の美術を鑑賞しないと日本美術の特色はわからないという、まあ、そういうことになっております、えー、まだ時間だ大丈夫ですか大丈夫もう時間ですか。もうなりました。え、もうそうそうです、えー。これもそうです。これはあの、えー、現在三ノ丸肖像館にあって、これはそのままの記述,記述が書かれていますけども、ここでも、えー、表紙、そして、えー、この作品についてはやっぱり造形の軸だと書いたんですね、えー。さてですね、時間がございますので、展示方法について。ちょっとと触れておきたいと思い思ます実はこの,この,あの展示はですねつい、えー、先日終わりまして私も、えー、高級レーターをしておりました、えー、ワシントンのナショナルギャラリーで行われた日本の動物展というあの展覧会なんですでこの展示をしたのはですね私の友人で、えー、一緒に高級レーターをいたしましたあまあ猿大きな美術館の学院ですが彼はこういうふうに並べたわけです
、えー、これでは日本の美術が特色がよくわからない、えー、いかがでしょうか日本の方はわかるのかもしれない日本の美術に触れてる方はわかるのかもしれませんけどこういう並べ方をまあするんですこれはあの西洋人がしたわけですけども日本でもないとは言えません日本の美術館でもないとも思えないので、えー、一言触れたいと思いますこれは私の友達の、えー、写真家の杉本博がですね私の美術館の千葉市美術館で、えー、やりまし開催しました展覧会のインスタレーションなんですでこの作品は日本的なインスタレーションになっているわけですつまり日本の美術はこのように並べないと一つの総合的なアンサンブルが成立しないということですもう一度この作品もワシントンで並べました、まあ、こういうところがですね日本美術の特色でありまして、えー、その辺のご理解とそして、えー、現在触れませんでしたけれども作品の取り扱い方日本の作品というのは短い期間を展示して繰り返し繰り返し表具をしながら50年100年というスパンで表具を保存の表具を修理をしながら伝えていく,いくわけですそして7世紀ぐらいのものも人から人の手へと伝えられて現在我々はその作品を維持しているわけです。えー、外国に行きますと展示替えということを理解していただかないことが多いんですけどもこの展示替えをして命を少しずつ流れていかなくちゃいけないです、えー、6か月1年並べたら3年並べないっていうんでは不動にならないんです日本の美術の場合は要するに私のような老人がですね今ここに出てきているから元気なんですもしうちの,のまうちの中にずっといたら多分もっと早く死んでると思うんですねそういうもんなんです日本の美術ってのはそういうもんなんですぜひその辺をご理解いただきたいと思いますし、えー、あと時間になったと思いますのであとはディスカッションのところで、えー、補足したいと思いますご清聴ありがとうございました Ladies and gentlemen,、um, it's a great honor and privilege to be part of this important discussion, and thanks for ICOM Kyoto for inviting me.、Um, I'm going to talk about two different topics. I will introduce Korean art workshop for curators from around the world, as this is a good model for building international network for Asian art curators. I'll also talk about my experience as an Asian born curator working in a Western museum and share with you a case study how I interpreted Sydney's Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences Asian Collection.、Uh, our museum is better known as a Powerhouse Museum. The Korean Art Workshop for Overseas Museum curators have been held from 1999 until 2017. Organized by the Korea Foundation in South Korea, these annual workshops allow the curators working with the Korean collections around the world to learn about aspects of Korean art and culture in depth. The program consisted of intensive lectures as well as field trips to relevant sites. Usually co hosted with other institutions, each year had a different theme. s And host museums usually had a special exhibitions relevant to the theme. The exhibition that I curated, Spear of Jang In, Treasures of Korean m e t a c r a f t held in Australia in 2011. Jang In is a Korean word for craftsman, and objects were on loan from the National Museum of Korea. This was very much influenced by the one of the workshop that I attended, Korean Buddhist Arts, in 2010. Because many、uh, metal craft objects are religious items in Korea. 
A significant aspect of the workshop was the opportunity to meet with East Asian art curators from around the world, with over 40 curators attending from museums across North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, the workshop provided a valuable opportunity to hear about and discuss ideas and projects that the curatorial colleagues are working on in museums. The majority of them were curators of Japanese and Chinese art, overseeing in Korean collections. So it was an invaluable opportunity to discuss not only Korean art, but Japanese and Chinese art as well. For me, it was always a wonderful opportunity to meet curators of Japanese and Chinese art, and this network has been an extremely helpful research source for my curatorial practice in Australia. These curatorial colleagues are now strongly connected in social media. We often exchange our knowledge, up-to-date research findings, and new projects. Another significant program which might be useful to mention is research surveys of Korean collections outside of Korea, undertaken by the National Research Institute of Cultural Heritage in South Korea. Since 1992, they have compiled data on Korean art collection around the world and supported research resources and publications. And this is an example of a publications of a Korean collection at the Tokyo National Museum and the Brooklyn Museum in New York. This project, too, has been an excellent way to share knowledge on Korean arts around the world. As a result, the National Museum of Korea included uh, links to 39 museums around the world to share Korean collections in their website. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my second topic. Uh, unlike much of a published research, this topic tends to be intimately linked with my personal development as an Asian Australian curator. As an Asian born curator working in an Australian museum, transcultural interpretation has been integral to my daily curatorial practice. In museology, many have argued that European views have, have been dominated museum presentation in Western countries, and often colonial ways of singing have decontextualized other cultures in museum presentation. As Asian myself, I was very much aware of this cultural issue and have endeavored to address it in my curatorial practice in Australia. However, I still face dilemmas from time to time, as the colonial view of Asia was deeply embedded in the early collection of the museum. We have significant pieces, including a Chinese blue and white porcelain dish from the early Ming Dynasty, cinema lacquer box and blue altar jar from the Chinese Qing Dynasty, and Sino-Tibetan Hindu figures from the 1400s. However, the majority of the collection initially did not seem to have a consistency in terms of Asian art his historical lineage, no clear logic of the collection as a whole. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about how I tackled this issue using a case study of an exhibition, Reflections of Asia, Collectors and Collections, which I curated last year. The museum originated from the Sydney International Exhibition in 1879. For many years, I have reflected in my curatorial practice on the nature of the Museum's Asian collection. This is a Japanese uh, exhibition at the time. To the eye of an Asian born curator, the collection felt somehow foreign because it was so different from the collections that I viewed in museums in Japan, China, and Korea. I concluded that this is essentially a result of being collected through a European-Australian lens. 
For example, this uh, large bronze incense burner, which was made during the Japanese Meiji period, uh, is elaborately decorated with many motifs that are unusual in the Japanese domestic context. My awareness of this issue has led to a new way of looking at the collection as a hybrid rather than as a representation of a traditional mainstream Asian art. In fact, the majority of the collection serves as an enduring record of Western fascination with Asia and its profound influences on Western aesthetics, technology, and design. My exhibition represented examples of Asian influences on the development of Western art and culture as well, including uh, porcelain productions, silk trade, this is, it looks like a kimono, but it was a provenance uh, to King George IV in England, and European imitation of Asian lacquerware called Japaning. With this concept and the museum's collection diversity, I was able to highlight the nature of the museum's Asian collection with many objects on dis display for the first time. The exhibition playfully celebrated the exoticism by reversing imposed exotic views of the East to the West. The Lolita dress showed how people in the East romanticized the exotic West. This popular Japanese kawaii street style was inspired by Victorian England and much admired by Japanese for its fantasy of exotic West. I wrote, I wrote on the museum's website, exoticism is not a negative concept but rather a simple recognition of otherness involving distances in time as well as place. It was and is my curatorial intention to invite visitors to the celebration of exoticism of both East and West through hybrid culture and museum collections and to witness changes in technology and design that were the result of mutual admiration. The exhibition aimed not to impose a negative view of colonial exotic. Rather, it celebrated exchange of culture, highlighting new and hybrid cultural objects in the museum's collection. I hope that this case study demonstrates that sometimes cultural clash becomes cultural enrichment and that new perspectives can emerge through challenging established views and utilizing creative approaches and thinking. That way, objects with the traditional narratives can be reinterpreted and new ideas and new ways of thinking introduced for the future. Thank you. Good morning. It is a true honor for me to be able to report on the work of the Arts Dialogue Committee of CULCON, something I'll mention a little bit more about later, which I currently co-chair with, uh, with Shimatani Hiroyuki, the director of the Kyushu National Museum. And I'd also like to express my appreciation to the ICOM Committee, who has worked tirelessly um, to make sure that participants here will not only have any successful meetings, but also have meaningful experiences that introduce them to the culture of Japan. Art has always served as an effective ambassador for Japan to the global community. During the 1960s and 1970s, Japan announced its revitalization through major international events, such as the 1964 Tokyo um, the Olympics and the Expo 70 in Osaka. Like the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, these international events attracted a new generation of enthusiasts of Japanese culture. 
Although the 10 years preceding the 1964 Olympics, there had been only 13 exhibitions of Japanese art in museums throughout the United States. In the 10 years that followed, there were 41 exhibitions in US institutions. Similarly, the field of Japanese art was witnessed tremendous growth during the late 1960s and 1970s in the numbers of students who were drawn to careers as professionals in Japanese art. The announcement of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics provided an opportunity for the Arts Dialogue Committee, a working group under the US-Japan Conference on Culture and Educational Interchange, Kalkan, to assess the state of Japanese art as it is practiced in the museum context. The Arts Dialogues Committee, or the ADC, had been tasked by the US and Japanese governments in 2010, specifically to examine the state of artistic exchange between the two countries, to, to identify any obstacles, and to explore new areas of cooperation. Although the presentation of Japanese art in the museum context was clearly thriving in 2010, looking ahead to 2020 for the Olympic year, it soon became clear that our field needed to make succession plans. We projected that by the time of the Tokyo Olympics, over 75% of specialists of Japanese art would be of retirement age. While we are a passionate and extremely hardy group, a new generation of curators needed to be trained and supported. The ADC identified as critical the revitalization of a highly effective program formerly called the International Workshop on Japanese Art History, affectionately known as JAWS. Established in 1987 by a committee of eminent Japanese and US art historians, including my fellow panelist, Ko Professor Kawai, the JAWS program brought graduate students together for over a week to give presentations and to participate in workshops and field trips. The fundamental concept was to share time and forge, and forge connections. And to this day, generations of former graduate students identify themselves by their JAWS class. Although the program had been held nine times and over the years sustained, about, um, and sustained over 240 participants, Due to a lack of funding, the program had been suspended after 2006. However, the Arts Dialogue Committee championed its revival. And since that time, there have been two JAWS, um, one in 2012 that was organized by Tokyo University of the Arts, and one in 2017 organized by Harvard University and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And we hope that there will be one taking place as scheduled in 2020 here in Japan. Building on these efforts the next, and to develop the next generation of Japanese specialists and to ensure the continued vitality of the presentation of Japanese art in the museum context, the Japan Foundation created five entry-level positions, five, in, five year entry-level positions at a number of institutions in the United States. Similarly, the Ishibashi Foundation has also generously funded a series of two year assistant curatorships at the Museum of Fine Arts. The current holders of these positions have coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, have largely been graduates of the JAWS program. In 2014, the Tokyo National Museum established the Curatorial Exchange Program for Japanese Art Specialists Abroad um, Planning Committee. It was a response to the ADC's call for a program that could create a network of Japanese art specialists and other museum staff members whose work involves Japanese art from North America and Europe so that information and curatorial practices could be more widely shared. Funded through the Agency for Cultural Affairs, the Tokyo National Museum program supports an annual public symposium, curatorial workshops and excursions, and specialist meetings. And the topics for this symposium have been, have been challenging. They've included the promotion and utilization of Japanese art in American and European museums, exhibiting Japan, the renewal and renovation of Japanese art galleries abroad, reinventing Japanese art through museum experiences, and last year, the arts of Japan in a global context beyond Orientalism and Occidentalism. With 
the endorsement of the ADC, the Japan Foundation has invited approximately 10 modern and contemporary curators from the US to Japan every year to provide the opportunity for a useful exchange of information, networking, and collaborative exhibition developments with their Japanese colleagues. Um, with the target participation of US curators who are not Japanese art specialists, the project was initiated with the aim of raising a greater interest in Japan and in introducing Japanese art to the United States, as well as promoting bilateral arts exchanges. And it, similar to the Tokyo National Exch um, Curatorial Exchange Program, there have been a variety of programs where curators have been going to look at different programs and exhibitions. And through these collaborations, there have been a number of exhibitions that have been uh, uh, organized in the United States, including one, which you see here on the screen, of Ishiuchi Miyako's post-war shadows at the Getty Art Museum. The ADC has also recommended the establishment of a bilingual digital clearinghouse of information about US-Japan arts activities called the International Network for Japanese Art, or INJA. It has envisioned the website as both centralizing and expanding specific resources, including information on curatorial and conservation exchanges, exhibitions, and collections. And we hope that this website will also provide information on procedures and preservation for US collections of Japanese art, both public and private. And most importantly, we hope that this website will provide a secure LinkedIn type platform for sharing information and communication among arts professionalists in the field of Japanese art. And I urge you, if you'd like, you're interested, to attend a symposium that will be held on Friday afternoon at the Kyoto National Museum, in which, you, um, to, in which we will be investigating how this website might serve as the focus of future international efforts in researching, presenting, and pr promoting Japanese art. As the Japanese art field has begun to address the needs of the next generation of curators, we've also had to consider the needs of the next generation of audiences, audiences who often require new models for global engagement with Japanese art. And so before we go on, I'd like to just mention very briefly as background different models that have been adopted in the past. The earliest model is that of the Victorian Albert Museum, which you see a picture on the screen, um, which was very influential in institutions as diverse as the Mun Museum of Fine Arts Boston, as well as the Tokyo National Museum. Following the, this model that, that the, um, the South Kensington Museum or the Victorian Albert had developed, primacy was given to displays organized by materials and techniques so that the public could be interested in design and thereby develop local industry. At the South Kensington Museum and others in the West, much such as, uh, such as the Museum of Fine Arts, the er earliest purchases were made purely for design inspiration. Even though museums might be interested in non-Western art, they did not really attempt to give any context for the objects. And in th this way, curators were not required to have any knowledge of Asian culture or Asian languages. However, in the first years of the 20th century, European museums, primarily those in Germany, began to adopt another model the Kulturgeschichte model, which has been defined in the words of the art historian Kathleen Curran as a methodology aimed at situating objects historically within their own original cultural context alongside religion, politics, philosophy, and science. And the Museum of Fine Arts was one of the first institutions to examine this new German model when it constructed its building on Huntington Avenue in 1909. And it was also part of an ongoing study by the Department of Japanese and Chinese Art under Okakura Kakuzo to underscore the importance of each object's context. Of course, interpretations of this type required curators to have sufficient knowledge of not only Japanese art history, but literature, religion, and other subjects. Now let's look at some of the new models that have been discussed in the curatorial exchange forums at the Tokyo National Museum. Some have been juxtapositions of contemporary and more traditional collections. Um, and I give you three examples here that have been discussed at the forum. 
And one of the primary attractions for curators who have worked in this way is that this type of presentation, juxtaposing contemporary and traditional, has dis disrupted the binary distinction between traditional and contemporary that relegates the works in older modes of presentation to Asian departments, while those in a more international style belong to departments of contemporary art, often divorcing them from their cultural background. Other exhibitions that have been discussed and European and US curators have brought attention to works that have not historically been part of the Japanese canon. For instance, shunga or erotic arts, which have often been widely censored here in Japan. Or conflicts of interest, art and war in modern Japan that took place at the St. Louis Art Museum, which looked at propaganda, such as 19th and early 20th century woodblock prints illustrating Japan's imperial ambitions Works at this time are rarely seen here in Japan. Today, as is been, as being discussed in these ICOM meetings, the nature of museums and their exhibitions is again undergoing profound changes, with greater emphasis placed on societal, political, and ethical issues. These topics will definitely require curators who have not different, but additional skill will require them to have additional skill sets. Some exhibitions of Japanese art, particularly of contemporary work, have focused on already on social issues, such as the one that we did on 311. However, the very organization of, of how we approach museum galleries is also being reconsidered. This January, at the Tokyo National Museum Curatorial Exchange Forum, our colleague Vivka Schrappa of the MKG in Hamburg challenged the attendees to consider the model adopted by her institution in presenting Asian art. The curators there understand their East Asian galleries as a venue of transcultural negotiation. They are spaces of encounters with historic as well as contemporary East Asian art for local as well as international audiences. They focus on the global movement of objects, people and ideas, rather than classifying objects according to epics, geographies, art and non-art. The MKG model is one that works well for a particular institution and a particular community. Different institutions will have to develop their own models, but the sharing of information by museum professionals has ensured that we constantly reevaluate our approaches to meet the needs of new generations of audiences. In conclusion, although many of the programs that the ADC incubated have entailed non-Japanese curators being provided more tools in order to present Japanese art in the context of their own institutions and communities. The nature of inter international collaborations, such as these ICOM meetings, means that there is open discussion about the larger presentation of Japanese art from multivalent points of view, from different areas of the world, not just Japan, and from different generations of curators and academics. And it is this type of inclusive presentation that will ensure that Japanese art is recognized as a global art. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I wanted to thank our speakers for uh, raising some very compelling uh, issues, a set of themes and issues uh, concerning the management of Asian art collections and Asian art museums around the world. I wanted to summarize very quickly some of these uh, issues. Dr. Christoph Lin started off uh, us off right away by introducing the problem of categorization and this history, especially in Europe, of categorizing Asian art collections as ethnology. And even though we as specialists have evolved in our understanding of Asian art, the structure of museums from their founding tends to continue, and thus there is a misalignment between the structures of museums we're dealing with in their own collections, and how he's using ICFA, the International Committee of Fine Arts, as a platform to try to address this question of categorization, among other things. Professor Kawai Masatomo, uh, his presentation underscores just how radically different the conditions for the display of Japanese art in the pre-modern period were with those today. We are talking about a society without a real culture of public exhibition, where things were shown in small, private, discrete spaces for temporary occasions. One did not display an artwork for a very long period of time, but possibly just a day or two. 
Uh, things like the mounting were appreciated along with the painting, which is often kind of cut out of our uh, framework for appreciating paintings today, and so forth. And so uh, his question, uh, his presentation really raises the question of uh, how we negotiate between these traditional practices for the display of Asian art and contemporary museum practice. And Dr. Min Jung Kim both introduced us to what has been going on recently to promote international exchange and uh, among uh, Korean art uh, curators and for the study of Korean art collections, but also her own experience at the Powerhouse Museum, uh, engaging a situation that I think many people are familiar with. This is a museum that has an Asian art collection with no seeming underlying logic of collection or categorization, and what to do with that, how to shape that thematically and interpretively, and it was very interesting to hear about her talk about the idea of a hybrid collection and to kind of pose different models of exoticism against one another in presenting this material. And we heard from Dr. Morse who, uh, about very specific strategies for the promotion and networking of Japanese art among curators and specialists internationally, those going on in the JAWS and uh, Tokyo National Museum International Curatorial Exchange uh, for example, and uh, also has led us through a kind of very uh, wonderfully panoramic overview of different models of display from the South Kensington to the Kunstgeschichte model to current paradigms of display uh, and the museum that might be useful for the exhibition and conceptualization of Asian art going forward. And I think it's important to ask ourselves how ICOM can serve as a useful, meaningful vehicle for continuing the work of this networking and exchange of ideas and practices that has been incubating uh, specifically at, uh, within Japan, Korea, and elsewhere in the Asian world. So with that summary, I'd like to open up the uh, venue to questions from the audience, comments, uh, question and answers, and th uh, anything that might come to mind as a way of um, furthering this discussion. And we have uh, microphones lined up in the in the aisle uh, for those of you who might be interested. And w I'm sure you have questions, but while we are waiting for you to uh, approach the microphone, I thought we might. Uh, oh yes, sir. Maybe. I'm just a member from Japan. I dare like to I dare like to ask you a very vague question to the specialist. What would be the characteristics of the Asian art and its meaning in today's world? Uh, thank you. That's a, uh, st starting us right off uh, with an easy question. I see. So I think I think maybe we can ask our panelists to uh, address this question uh, in. Uh, any way they see fit based on their kind of very rich personal and professional experience grappling with the question of a, the problem of Asian art. あの、<笑> あの、日本はですね、そういうあ、
我々は世界の一員として我々の持っている文化資産をどうやって活用しながらですね、えーまあ、世界の中で貢献していくかそしてまあ美術館という一つの組織の中でそういう世界的貢献ということをしていくためには何があるか。えー、昨日は少しちょっとポリティカルな話が多すぎたんで私にはちょっと理解できなかった部分があったんですけどもしかしそれも含めてですね我々おそらくあの過去の日本の人もですねあるいはアジアの中国の人とか韓国でも同じようなことが行われていて決して狭い東洋ということ東アジアという観点で我々が文化を維持してきたわけではないと思うわけなんですが。他の皆さんはいかがでしょう Well, I think it's very interesting. Professor Kawai、uh, mentions that in Japan, the exhibition, which has been、uh, a space in which Asian art from other parts of East Asia has been sedimenting from very early on, since the 7th, 8th century at least. Uh, it offers models of historical practice for this kind of space for transcultural negotiation that Dr. Morse talked about as a contemporary model practice at Hamburg and elsewhere for the study of Asian art. And I think it's this, this, the key word here is negotiation between traditional and、uh, historical models and the contemporary needs of art museums in Asia. And around the world, that this is something again that we are attempting to develop and continuously、uh, evolve models of interpretation for through the networking, the kinds of structures for exchange that, that we've been、uh, discussing. Are there any other questions or uh, uh, comments from the audience、uh, concerning some of these? Yes, we have one、uh, over on this side. Thank you, everybody. My name is James Fu. I come from China and I work for the Geological Museum of China. And、uh, everybody knows there are so many amazing collections、uh, from China, but they belong to other,、uh, other museums all over the world in UK, in USA, in,、uh, in Japan. And you know, I know、uh, that is、uh, because of this situation, is because of the history. But you know, my people live in China. They have strong wishes to see our history, to see our collections in our homeland. So, is that possible in the future that the, so many museums, you can bring the collections from China、uh, back to our homeland year by year, city by city, for some special exhibitions? So, that can help my people to see my history. In my homeland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have、uh, three curators of Asian art who work overseas outside of Asia on the panel. So, Anne, would you like to say a few words? I work at a museum that has very large Asian collections that were put together primarily in the 19th century. And I have always viewed that it is my museum's responsibility to take care of those works of art that they've been entrusted to us. And therefore, it's also very important that we share those works of art. So I think one thing that、uh, my expertise is in Japanese art, but I think it has been actually very wonderful that my museum has been able to send numbers of exhibitions back here to Japan. It enables us to share the works of art that we do have, it also enables us to learn more about the works that we do. Um, and it has created great bonds between、um, institutions here in Japan and, and, and Boston. So, yes, I do think it is possible. I think with the number of museums that are developing in China, if resources could also be put into these kinds of exhibitions, I think there'd be a lot of institutions in the United States and Europe that would like to be willing, that would be willing to share their collections again. Thank you. And I think this is,、oh, this is precisely one area where ICOM can make, I think, a big difference in connect, making connections between curators and museum professionals working in Asia with those working、uh, outside in, in addressing issues like this uh, uh, steward care, shared ownership, exchange of objects,、uh, and so forth between Asia and the rest of the world.、Uh, so,、uh, are there any more questions from? 
uh, for comments from the audience. Yes, I see a hand raised there, sir. え、私の英語ではちょっと誤解を招くような、えっと、質問をしてしまうかもしれませんので、ここは日本語でどうぞご勘弁ください。え、he uh, 私、2年間ほどニュージーランドの方で多く Uh, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I was born and educated in Korea, so I'm very much Korean inside of me. But working and living in Australia, um, this issue is a daily issue for me. Uh, meeting, you know, the, in in a Western uh, context, uh, you know, living in a Western context. And people see me as an exotic Asian sometimes in Australia from Western perspective. And for, through this exhibition, they wanted to actually present, you know, exotic is not only East, but in when I lived in Korea, West was exotic. So through this exhibition, I wanted to play. It was more of the play uh, rather than criticizing uh, about the exoticism. And that's where I think it's a junction that we can actually come together and uh, look at this issue of different cultures. That, that's why I, uh, my small attempt to, to have this exhibition uh, celebrating exoticism. Is that, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> A small moment of cultural exchange there, too. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Anything we can, uh, we, we can address there? Uh, yes, we have a question from the back there. Hi, hello. Thank you for your talks today. I'm a Malaysian student cur currently studying in Taiwan. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any comments about um, collections of about material culture, things that are kind of like not really included in the fine arts in um, Asian art museums around the world. Thank you. Okay, a question about material culture. Uh, actually, Anne, we'll ask Anne to start off and we have. I think the definition between about what is considered art is very, very difficult one, particularly in the Asian context because we do not, in displays, uh, privilege paintings and sculptures in the, quite the same way that you might in Western art. And so um, it's also very challenging when one gets into the tw 19th century or even the Edo period when you think about Japanese woodblock prints, they were as much part of material culture as we now elevate them to the fine arts. I have been um, involved at the museum in, in the celebration of, the, of postcards. Um, we have a very large collection of postcards, and that has led to the collecting of many other kinds of visual cultural materials. But how to define what belongs in the museum and what does not belong in the museum is a very difficult question. And right now, to be quite honest, it's whether I respond to it visually or not. That's <laughs> really the bottom line. But I mean, I'm hoping that there will be more discussions about this so we can talk about that, that particular issue. Thank you for the word discussion, and I would once again uh, like to promote membership in the ICFA. This is a, a platform for discussions of this kind, and, and it's an, a question of how to distinguish art from non-art, from 
what its meaning, how to put it on display, and so on. It's not something that can be just ordered from above, but has to be discussed and has to be revisited over and over. It's not that we once create an eternal truth. Things are unchanged, the world is changing, and our view on art is as well. Please all join the discussion. Thank you. So you've, 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 you've heard again, uh, ICFA as a platform within ICOM for a, a, uh, for a continuation of these uh, themes. And as we uh, move towards wrapping up this uh, plenary session, I think it's important to, uh, I think, recognize that we are not only uh, addressing issues of conservation and care of Asian art collections in Asia and overseas, or the exchange of knowledge and know-how among different communities of curators uh, around the world. But as we move forward in ICOM and elsewhere to think about what Asian art and its care and the issues surrounding it can teach us or help us inform larger issues of concern to the ICOM and, and global museum community, like how museums can help contribute to a sustainable future, work towards disaster relief, can function as cultural hubs, and so forth. These are all questions that have been, are being dealt with in the Asian museum world as well, according to, and sometimes in, in slightly different ways, according to the contingencies of societies in this part of the world. So as one a set of issues and themes moving forward, I think this is some, uh, one area that we can really uh, make, uh, uh, draw kind of meaningful uh, exchanges from and learn a great deal from what is going on in Asia and through the experiences of Asian art curators globally. Now, uh, with that said, we're out of time for the plenary art session, so uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists again for their presentations. Please give them a big round of applause. Um, and we'd also like to thank you for coming uh, to attend the panel and to thank the ICOM organizing committee for all their work. Thank you very much.